I know the program said that this presentation would be given by David Herringly, but I'm sad to report that uh, David died earlier this month, suddenly. Uh, so, as Vice President, I will now assume his duties. And uh, we're in the process, having met with the board uh, yesterday, we're in the process of getting ourselves reorganized so we can carry out this, this work. Very sad situation. But uh, I don't want to cast a pall on what we have to show you today because I think we have some, some pretty exciting things. A group of people formed IAP in mid-2009. And the idea behind it was there's so much technology around today, which is relatively expensive, and which could uh, bear heavily on our understanding of the things that we collect uh, by understanding how they were made, what they were made of, whether they're real or not. And the idea behind the group was to, was to collect people like you, people who are either scientists or who are interested in science and technology, and apply it to philatelic problems. We debated among ourselves what kind of stance we wanted to take, how, how we wanted this organization to look and feel. And we decided real early on a couple of important guidelines. Number one, we did not want to be an expertizing agency. We didn't want to be seen as arbiters of people's arguments uh, with dealers and auction houses or with other collectors about whether something's real or whether it's been altered, because that would forever damage our ability to be seen as, as objective observers. Number two, we didn't want to actually do research ourselves as an organization, although members of the board and members of the organization may well do research. We didn't want to be seen as a, as a uh, supermarket where people could go and pay us money and have us do their projects. Instead, we collected a considerable amount of of money, many tens of thousands of dollars from, from donors. And we hold these funds to be given away to people like you or to people you might know who want to do research but need some funding. And the funding needn't go for analytical methods or paying somebody to do uh, x-ray. It can go for airfare and hotels to go to Washington, maybe to the National Postal Museum, for example, and uh, can use the equipment there. It can be used for anything, uh, provided that there's a product at the end of the research. We don't want to just give money away so that people go on trips. So our main goal right now is finding people who want to take this money from us. It's quite amazing. You know? And it's, it's not been easy. We're standing out there waving $100 bills, and the maximum grant by is $5,000. So it's the significant funds that we're, we're happy to use to support people doing research. We supported quite a few projects. We realized that it would be good to try to disseminate some of what had been learned on these projects. And so uh, David Herringy, bless his heart, came up with the idea of holding an international symposium, not only on the projects that had been all done already, but on things other people may have done on their own. And we did that. Uh, it was this past November in Washington. And so that's what this program this morning is about. And the gentleman who will present to you is Tom Lara, who's the research chair at the uh, National Postal Museum of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. So. I'll shut up, Tom, and let you take over. Uh, I'm going to be talking again, Chad. <laughs> I'm going to chat about the what was what happened at the symposium. It was held at the National Post Museum in Washington, D.C. The organizers were Dave, John, and Jim Allen, and we were the host. The IAP did all the work, and all the National Postal Museum did was provide the venue. 50 plus peoples attended for three days from five countries attended the meeting and we had 13 different speakers plus we had a full day of hands-on using the equipment 
with technical reps from the companies that built the equipment giving the demonstrations. I'm sorry, there was from six countries. We had Canada, United Kingdom, David Beach and Chris Harmon, and from Canada, if you know Charles Burrs, he was there, Ted Nixon. From Colombia, Sweden, and Austria, they came, and several of them presented papers. So what is analytical philately? This is Dave Harrity's slideshow, so I guess he was into uh, Predator. Simply stated, analytical philately is the use of modern technology and developments to answer previous unanswerable military questions, including high magnification microscopy, visible lights, chemical, and mathematics, to name a few. The purpose is simple, to discover facets of the stamps and other philatelic artifacts that have been previously unknown. Everybody wants to get it right, so we all ask the questions. What topics were discussed? David Beach, librarian at the British Library, uh, head of the philatelic collections, been at the British Library for 30 years, is actually retiring in March. Gave the keynote address on the place of analytical philately, the place of analytical methods in philately, and related it to expertizing. Excellent keynote speech. Dr. Bruce Kaiser, chief scientist, created the XRF, X-ray fluorescence spectroscope. And he spent uh, an hour discussing how X-rays are photons and how X-rays can be used to, do, to discover the chemical elements in a ink or in a paper. Chemical elements uh, ranging from sodium to uranium. Our little Bruker XRF handheld uh, Star Wars gun can, can identify all of these elements very easily and very simply with very, very little training. John Barowitz, measuring paper characteristics of the US 3 cent banknote issues. Uh, basically, I can paraphrase what John says, he debunked a lot of myths about the, the paper that the American Bank Home Company, the Continental and the National Bank Home Company did, and presented it a whole different way to look at the papers and identify the papers. About right? Yeah. Better than I could have said it myself, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have, uh, from Canada, uh, Garfield and Charles, they did a comparative study of security measures used by stamp printers. They took several Canadian stamps and identified all the security features on them. And one of them was the $10 whale stamp. I don't know if you've seen it, it's a, rec it's a rectangular stamp. It's, used, it's an oversized stamp used for parcels. And there's 22 different security features on it. And the VSC 6000, which is a visual spectral comparator, has a 24 light sources, and a whole bunch of analytical uh, features to it. And you can look at the stamp and find all these security features. And they found them and they identified them and presented them to us. A bid did a comprehensive forensic investigation of the plate 77, the penny, penny reds. And uh, what happened was it's a controversial issue, plate 77, was it created or was it, was it fabricated? There's seven known copies in the world. The British Library, which holds the philatelic collection, uh, has two copies, and then there's five known on cover. And they don't know if it was an actual plating method done by Perkins Bacon, or if it was a reconstructed two that was made into a seven, or a three that was made into a seven, and a bid claims that it's a valid plating, and as such, he presented some highly, highly technical work that was done to show that it was an actual stamp, and it was actually done by Perkins and Bacon, and it wasn't fabricated. And they sent it off for certification, recertification at the Royal and the Philatelic Foundation. And hopefully you'll get it. Uh, Dr. Ka uh, Lyman Kaiswell did the reflective spectroscopy of colored overprints. He basically used the VSC 6000, looked at the overprints, 
and they were done on hung Hungarian stamps, and it's a lot of forgers created over prints on the Hungarian stamps, and the VSC 6000 can focus down to the different inks that were used for the overprints, and you can compare those inks based upon the reflectance curves, and that's what his paper presented. Uh, Dieter did new ways of looking at pre-philatelic inks. He's from Colombia, and he used some equipment down in Colombia that they, their advertising group did, or has, and uh, he showed that he was able to determine the different inks that were used on the pre-philatelic items. And he, was, he showed that he could, spectroscopy could be used to look at the different characteristics of the inks to determine if they were new or actual. Here's something that I don't know very much about. Tom Gill talked about the application of pixie analysis to philately. I know that there's only like seven or eight pixie machines in the world. I don't even know what pixie stands for. And I know that it takes two hours to set the machine up to do the stamp. And the argument or the discussion that we had was, is it pixie or can you just use it with x-ray diffraction? They both do the same thing. Pixie was uh, created in the 70s and 80s. X-ray diffraction was in the 70s and 80s, but now it's become very, very user-friendly and it, the technology is developed to replace Pixie. So there's been a lot of papers about Pixie, and I, I don't even know what it stands for, I'm sorry to say. Hey, Tom, it's, it's proton-induced X-ray emissions. Okay. So what you do is you zap your target, whatever it is, let's say some ink you want to stamp, you zap it with a proton stream. It changes electron levels in the, in the ink. And you emit X-rays, and you can you can match item one with that item two if they have the same emission. Okay, all right. And they're very expensive machines. They're very they're very, very expensive machines, and X-rays are photons. So this is out uh, emitting. Luckily, photons. there's one. And four, we're looking at the electrons that come off. Yeah. There's so one four miles a, from my it's house. It's a nice circle. Which we have permission to use for free. So there's two places in the in the world that I know they exist. Well, oh, actually, there's, there's one in Iran. In Iran. Yeah. <laughs> it's harder to get permission. Yeah, it's probably really like below ground. Uh, Dave Harrigan did a paper, a mathematical uh, paper on statistical estimates of rare sand populations, where he, he used the uh, animal capture formulas. Basically, it's tag and release, and then recapture. You can determine how many animals were in, in, in a population in a given area. And he applied that, te that technology to rare stamps. And surprisingly, uh, he verified that uh, rare stamps could be used, could be calculated, the number of rare stamps could be calculated using this method. Uh, Roland Cipolla gave a layman's adventure, uh, forensic adventure, he had, or has, a cover with an 1851 bisect. Okay, it's a one cent, and it's bisected for the half cent rate, and it was used for transmitting newspapers within a state and within a county. And the post office had a half cent rate back at that time. For 10 years it had a half cent rate, and this is the first known example of a one cent bisect and it was certified by the Philatelic Foundation as a genuine item. And he used the VSC 6000 and the XRF, and he also used the FTIR, Fourier Transformed Infrared, and he showed that uh, it was a valid, genuine item. And I believe you'll see it for sale by Siegel coming up in March. I made about a thousand phone calls. <laughs> I don't know that portion of it, but he probably did make about a thousand phone calls. Did he call you? Oh yeah, <laughs> several times, before, during, and after. <laughs> Jim Allen looked at, Jim Allen who's here in the audience, looked at the 1851 three cent color chemistry and, and the changes. You want to say anything about it, Jim? For Chavis Packard. Yeah, over the years, uh, written in history, there were some opinions based on limited information about what these inks were and what they were. And 
from anybody who knows anything about the 1851, we started off as orange brown colors, and these are the famous orange browns, you know, in the fall of 1851. And then over a period of 10 years, they went through all kinds of color changes. These were alleged to be certain chemicals, alleged to be iron oxide and colored with vermilion, which is mercuric oxide. I'll get technical here. And it turns out there's no vermilion in these stamps. Not at all. And they had the color schema and the chemistry, basically a lot of it all wrong. Okay? And this has been perpetuated by numerous authors over the years. And what I showed was there was a transition made from these orange browns to other stamps. And there's uh, coming up in the Chronicle, I'll be some articles about this, about why they probably did this. Before people said it was vermilion, once they said it was vermilion, they said, well, they did it because vermilion was very expensive. And if supplies were from England, they had to get out of it. But it turns out that's not exactly true. And so then this led into a whole different pigment family that was previously undescribed, okay? And there's even more nuances coming out after a few more years uh, where things were told you know, not to exist. That, no, this was never done, this was never used, and all that. So what we did was look at some data, some real analysis, and found out what these were, and found out that, hmm, not as has been portrayed over the years, and its relevance to collectors, the chemistry is, because what I'm also going to describe is what every collector should know who has these stamps about how to protect them, what to really watch for, how to keep them fresh and bright, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it has several you know, offshoots and all that. But I thought it was very interesting. I didn't know, I'll tell you, I didn't want to do this work. I didn't start off to do this work. But we went to the Smithsonian and I looked at just a couple samples to look at the testing equipment. And this is how this works, give you ideas. And I got excited by what I saw because it's very different than what anybody expected. And so that led into the research that really opened up this whole thing. And so it just shows you that, you know, what we think we know sometimes is, is not necessarily that accurate. And that by doing some of this work, you can head off into, you know, exploring and also defining other problems that we had no idea. And then it explains later on what was going on and why and what problems they were having. So just kind of serendipitous. And you case. said this would be printed in the product? Um, yeah, it's going to be published, uh, Tom will talk about this. We'll publish these proceedings, and then this is being expanded on. We've run a lot more information, data now generated, and that will be expanded on, and it'll be in a chronicle, and probably a couple articles, but I can't tell you when that will be coming out. Are you going to talk we, about the book, Tom? Yeah, we've run over 200 samples of the 1851 orange browns, and our, we've been now analyzed it on many different pieces of the book, and we're presenting that. Uh, David did another property, another paper, I'm sorry, on documenting science in the philatelic literature. The theme of the paper was to, to get the scientists to dummy down to the lay people so that all the technical science was, was taken down to the layman so they could understand it. Myself and Jennifer and Nicole, we did an analytical philately of the London printings of the 1853-1862 Chile stamps. The first issue of Chile was in 1853. It was printed by Perkins Bacon. And uh, they did six, they did three printings of six stamps. And there was a, a, a red, a blue, a green, and a yellow. And they were called vegetable inks. So our goal was to take all of the stamps, all six, three issues, six stamps, and use every piece of scientific equipment that we could find to analyze it. So we started out in the NPM lab and we did the visual spectral comparator. And I also want to say non-destructive analysis. We did not use any wet chemistry. So we used the VSC 6000, we used the micrometer, we used the XRF, the X-ray fluorescence, the handheld, and then we used the Artex FTIR, which is also a handheld instrument. We then went over to the Museum Conservation Institute where Jennifer and Nicole are, and since that's where all the Smithsonian big machines are, we used one of their bigger FTIRs. We used an X-ray diffraction machine, which is a fairly large machine. And we then analyzed the results to determine the, how the chili stamps were printed, what were the components of the ink, what were the components of the paper, and uh, to show how easily you could come together with an answer on, on the inks. And we found that the instruments 
are compatible. Compatible meaning one different FTIR, one FTIR made by uh, Thermal Science and one FTIR made by Bruker will give you the same results. Not surprising, but they actually do. So, uh, you know, we confirmed that, you know, we confirmed two different XRD machines, X-ray diffraction machines, produce similar results. And our, one is easier to use than the other. We basically wanted to show uh, to Labless that you could come in with your project, determine what machines you wanted to do, and these are the expected results you can, you can see from each machine. And uh, it worked out pretty well, pretty well. We found a lot of interesting things. For instance, the yellow stamp, the one that's in yellow, is loaded with vermilion. There's vermilion throughout it, and it's a fairly strong vermilion color in a yellow stamp. Okay. That was one thing we found. We found a whole bunch of other things in it, and you'll read it in the paper. Harry Britton, forensic study of ink and paper of the uh, CSA stamps, numbers 11 and 12. Oh, 7 and 8, I'm sorry, 7 and 8. Harry is a scientist. He has his own XRD and FTIR machine in his basement. He's, a, he's an expert for the drug companies. He's a chemist, and uh, he does, oops, that's not good, is it? And uh, he does a, a lot of work for, for them. And he presented, oh, please, it's not my computer, so I don't know. Uh -oh. Battery goes. No, I think it's my machine. Because I don't have a screen. I'm sorry. I went to sleep. Pardon? I think it went to sleep. Well, pour some coffee in there. It's irrelevant. That's just coming out of there. That's coming out of there. Do you have a battery to plug in? Or no, I don't. Your charger? Nope. No. Your screen has gone blank. My screen's gone blank. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyways, we're almost finished with the slide showing. That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Harry presented it, and uh, he ran the uh, XRF and the XFTIR on the Confederate stamps. And he was able to determine the different fillers of, on the paper, or made with the paper. And he was able to show that he could determine the different printers. Because those stamps were printed not only in Richmond, they were also printed in South Carolina. And the, and the Confederate expertizers have, uh, had a hard time differentiating between two of the printings. And he then presented his analysis, and he did it on well over 100 different stamps. And then he went back to the expertising committee and laid 10 of them out on the table and said, identify which ones these were from, which printers they were from. And they got six out of 10 wrong. So, you know, I mean, he's looked at a new way of uh, analyzing the stamps and uh, changing the evaluations that the expertisers are coming up with. So, uh, I do believe that was the last one that, of, of the papers. And what do we have? We have the IAP. The IAP has scholarships available, like John said. All you have to do is apply for one. Come up with an idea for a project. The National Post Museum has scholarships available. All you have to do is apply for one. Send me an email or send John an email, and we can set you up with the applications to, uh, to fund it. The National Post Museum, the lab, is open to any one of you all. Y'all can come down. As Jim will explain, and Mark and uh, Richard and and Richard 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 will explain that uh, training on the machines to learn how to use them can go from anywhere from three minutes to use the micrometer on off. You can use it right-handed or left-handed. <laughs> <laughs> you can use either one. Turn it on and off. 
or you could spend uh, two hours on the uh, XRF to learn how to use the XRF or the FTI or the Fourier Transform Infrared Spectrometer. It takes a little bit longer to use and it's the analysis of the data is a little bit harder. But so we have the visual spectral comparator, very easy to learn. You can do everything from looking at different colors to looking at uh, cancellations. You can see if, if overprints are over or under a cancellation. You have a half a cancellation. You can fill out that circle and determine the size of the, uh, the cancellation. You can look at watermarks. It's got 24 different light sources. It's got reflected and transmitted. You can do absorption or transmission analysis on it. It's a very functional machine. Attached to that machine is a Leica microscope that goes up to 1600x. Okay, it's optical, not digital. All right, so you can see the whether or not paper's been reperfed. You can see that. You can see if how fibers were broken and how they would have to be reattached. You can get down to a really fine level with this machine, and it runs through the VSC 6000. So you can analyze everything you're looking through the microscope with the VSC software. And the microscope measures in microns. So you can do all your measurements and then do your simple conversions to get that. Very easy to learn. Micrometer, I said, is easy to learn. The XRF, it's a handheld uh, X-ray machine, X-ray fluorescence. It's a, it actually looks like a Star Wars gun. You put the stamp up on the, on the uh, platform and you run the, the sample from 30 seconds to three minutes and you get your peaks. And then you press a button or you click a pull down menu and all your peaks are identified. Tells you the chemical, and then you can take all that data home and, and analyze it. As Jim knows, I send him the data all the time. And then uh, the FTIR is another machine that probably takes the longest to learn, three hours maybe. But uh, the sampling is very good, and it, it it tells you quite a bit about organics. It gives you a great fingerprint of the stamp. And all this equipment is available. So if you all think of the uh, problem that you have, you can come and use the equipment. The lab's open from 8 until 4. And, uh, you know, I'd love to have you down. There's a lot of open time. The IAP has also, um, the IAP has also signed uh, partnerships. Okay. We call them research alliances. It's strange. Yeah. With uh, other groups, groups, one of which is uh, Rutgers University. Dr. Gene Hall, you probably might have seen some of his papers on x-ray analyses of, of inks. Uh, so he has equipment that can be used. We signed an alliance agreement with the uh, Center for Ink and Printability uh, Research at the College of Engineering at Western Michigan University. And they can run tests, non-destructive and destructive tests. They can run non-destructive tests on paper stiffness. You actually have a machine that measures how, how much force is needed to bend paper by a certain distance. And you can discern differences in paper types, which look identical, but which in fact are not identical. They can measure permeability of paper in a non-destructive way. Uh, destructive tests, they can, they can actually repulp a piece of paper and wind up with a slurry that's solid than the slurry the stamp started as, and measure fiber length, fiber width, fiber, fiber deformation indices. Um, we have this Pixie machine that's available to us at the college near where I live. They're happy to work for us. They have a, a world-class web chemistry lab there and they'll do staining. Some of these alliances need to be paid for their, their work. So presumably if you were to, for example, get a $5,000 grant, you might use 2,000 of it for food and sleeping somewhere. The other three thousand to pay the lab fees for for the lab that you've been using. And then a miracle happened. And the well, computer came back on. We just decided to do that on its own. Yeah. I think the battery is low. Yeah. You think? Yeah. And the battery is the yeah, so battery is down to one bar. So thirteen minutes left. How <laughs> fast, Tom? Thirteen minutes. I think it's a charger, but it's a dial charger. Yeah, this is HP, so I don't know. Uh, Blow it up. Is it nothing mine by him? See, I don't think Daniel is going to do that. Anyways, the uh, proceedings for the conference. The proceedings are going to be published by the Smithsonian.
will probably be out in June. And like the Blount symposiums, the proceedings are free. All you have to do is, uh, you'll, there'll be announcements in the, in the philatelic press, and all you have to do is uh, fill out a little form online to the Smithsonian Institution Scholarly Press, and they will send you a copy. Or else you can send me an email, and I will send you a copy. And if you're a member of the IAP, the IAP is going to send you a copy. So, you know, we do publish quite a bit. And are we going to have another conference? Yes. I was over in London last week talking with the British Library and the Royal Philatelic Society of London. And we'll probably have another conference in London. And uh, it'll be in 2014. And it'll have this similar type of format. It'll have two days of papers and one day of hands on. And, uh, and we'll probably have another conference in 2016 at, at New York, at the International Conference, uh, Stamp Show in New York in 2016. So in the next four years, we'll probably have two more conferences. And the conferences depend upon how much research y'all do and uh, participate. We'd love to have people come in and do research and try and encourage research being done nationwide. And we come around and help you whenever we can. My door is always open. My phone's always on. Feel free to call and ask me questions. If you're not an IAP member now, you should be. If you give me your email address, I'll be happy to mail you an application. Any questions? This is a little bit off to the side, perhaps, but several years ago, I put together a special lamp called Stamp Lamp, which used LEDs of different wavelengths to provide a single desktop lamp with a UV source for stamp collectors, and uh, it turned out my idea was to provide the lamp so that people could do their own sort of mini analysis by just looking at the stamps in different wavelength lights. And we sold some, especially to stamp expertizers. But it turned out at that time that the price point was such that it was around $500, it was kind of what it was. We sold some, to some initial users, then we decided it wasn't commercial, commercially uh, viable kind of thing to do. It was an interesting experiment for us to actually uh, do this lamp. We had a three-digit uh, three LED readout of approximate wavelength, so people could jot down the wavelength. And we used uh, one of the higher powered uh, UV LEDs in the center of the matrix of LEDs with lenses. And just mentioning in passing that that was an effort at that point. Yeah, the VSC 6000 has something similar to that, except it's got 24 light sources. And if you run the auto exam feature on it, it'll do, it'll run through every possible light source, every combination that you can think of, and there's 255 different combinations. What's the cost of that? It? Uh, it's uh, about 80K. And uh, it'll run through, it takes about 15 minutes to run it, to run the program. So what I tell people is that if they want to run that program, they you know, hit enter and it starts cranking out the program, now they can take a bathroom break, they can go to the restaurant, get a cup of coffee, and by the time they get back, all the analysis will be done. And then you look on the screen, the thumbnails on the screen, well, they're, they're pretty big thumbnails, and you select what image you want, and you click on that image, and that image then goes to the main screen. And it's a 30-inch monitor that it's, it's attached to, so you get real high definition of your images. And you can select what image, and it'll tell you what light source it is, and then you've got it, the VSC 6000 saves everything as a TIFF file, high density, uh, uh, five megabyte TIFF tif file. So it's all publication quality images. And yeah, if you come to the lab, it's important that you bring a flash drive so you can take all your pictures home, all your data home, because everything's transferable. And if you don't have the program for the XRF, I give you a little program for the XRF so you can look at the data, because you can't, you need their program to look at Otherwise, I'd give it to you on an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, can you come on weekends? No, I don't work on the weekend. <laughs> Sorry. Is there a website with some of this information available? If you go to the National Postal Museum website and click on the Research tab, you can find out information about the scholarships. Otherwise, you have to call me or write me. I can give you that information after the meeting. Okay, you can just Google Institute for Analytical Philately, I'll take you right to the website. Yeah. Also, I have a question. All this talk about uh, proton activation and you know, Zan.
mapping it with high energy X rays, isn't there some danger that some of this would be destructive testing? No. It's all non destructive testing. The high energy, the XRF, X ray fluorescent, only goes up to 40 keV, which is very low. If you go get a chest X ray, you're looking at 120 keV at a, with high power behind it. This is very low power. If, the dense, if you put the stamp on the platform, the X rays only go an inch and a quarter through the stamp. So while the class is X rays, most people wouldn't think of these X rays, but you know they have to be. Besides, we don't call them X rays; we call them photons. <laughs> and they're they're flying around right now. Okay. Very low energy. <coughs> That's what's nice. I mean, this technology, in some effect, was available 70, 80 years ago, but it was very expensive. Very, very expensive. The problem is, all of it was destructive at that time. It has been for many years. So what's nice about this is completely non-destructive. I put extremely valuable stamps under all this with. Until Tom uses it. Until Tom uses it. Hey, this is Daniel Piazza's computer. Oh, okay. Not my computer. And there's no battery in it. So. I've, I've been struggling trying to come up with the wording on this question, so it doesn't sound like I'm too many. But is there any way uh, to come up with a complete list of all the papers that have ever been used? and all the inks that have been used to, cre to create stamps. I know there's a, probably a finite number of printers. And if so, what would it take to, to come up with that list? And how practical would it be to do that? It would be pretty hard to do, because most of the ink formulas were proprietary. Perkins and Bacon's, they didn't uh, disclose their ink formulas. They gave you ideas of what the ink formula was. For instance, for the chili stamps, they said they're red, green, yellow, and vegetable ink stamps. That's what they said. When you look at them, you know, they came out to be a, a, a lead chromate. They came out to be a, a Venice red, Venetian red, all natural. Yeah. Well, there's, yeah. That, there's that color of, the color chemistry book. What's the name of that book, Jim? By White. By no, no, no. Pigment and Pendium. Pigment compendium. That does it. That does it. It, it tells you the pigment compendium, <coughs> which when you come to the lab, I give you a copy of it, an electronic copy of it. It tells you, you can, and you can look up the pigment lead, and it'll tell you all the possible combinations of lead pigments that were used for coloration, and when it was first used, and what the first reference was. It'll tell you all that. If you have a computer here, I can give it to you now. But, uh, yep. Before I answer, further answer your question, the formulation should be interesting to quite complex. Most of the time they have two, three, four pigments, and then you have all this other ancillary stuff in there. Okay. They have bands of use for various pigments, and where you have to study to find the ink formulations, you have to study the fine arts. Okay, Most of the quality information is in the fine arts for paintings, because one, they have had money to do this work, mm -hmm. and the pigment suppliers were supplying the ink bakers basically often same inks that were used in fine arts. They were just pigment makers, and you do what you want to do with it at the time. So you have bands of use. Bands of in time? time? Bands of time, uh -huh. okay, of use of these things, okay, and overlapping. Some of these things lasted 600 years, some lasted 60 years. Then you have introduction of new things that came along that might be very rare, then become very common, okay? Mm -hmm. And it varied per printer, Okay. And then to sort through what the pigments are based on the elemental compositions that you can actually assess with this equipment requires a little bit of thinking and, and kind of sometimes heavy weight analysis. And sometimes you can only uh, guess at what it probably is and say it is most likely this because of these elements and this time period. It's a, it's a, it's a huge project. Well, but then yes. some of the early printers here in the U.S. like with the 1861 issues, their formulas could have changed during the course of a week. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, right. just, and, and in Whatever the course of the day, a guy mixing a pot. Right. He mixed and it up in his basement. The basic chemistries, you know, yeah. what we're talking about, the basic chemistries, yeah. Yeah. stayed the same over the lifetime for the most part, uh, with the exception of the 1851s, where we showed. Some lasted six months, and then the basic chemistry changed, and then it varied a little bit 
And then all of a sudden, seven years later, somebody introduced some more things. Three years before that, somebody introduced a couple more things. And so you can see these things move around. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, remember, they're making billions of cents, billions right. of cents, 10 year period. And all the ink makers, uh, that was a proprietary in house thing after the law, except for black inks. And so they had their own ink makers in house. And in doing this, between, you know, a lot of these things were natural, by the way, it's not mentioned they were natural. By 1820, 1840. That was, that was being fun. No, well, they're natural, they said a lot of them were mined. And but by 1820, 1840, a lot of these were chemically manufactured. Okay, and it's funny, there's a break point around 1850. 1870, there's huge break points in that. It's the entire world of pigments throughout the world. Okay? Yeah. And so, to answer your question, it's extremely complex. You can get at it, but a lot of times you have to go to numerous sources. Now, what we have learned, Tom and I and others have learned in the last couple of three years, is a lot more sources for information on what the likely material was for that time period. So, somebody has already done some of the study for you, was it? But when you no, said part of the uh, there's no companion in the No, no, but when you said art, I mean, is it oil paint? Oil yeah. paint? Or right, right. what about uh, watercolors? Is that an yes, we have to, there's an overlap, but yeah. there's only an overlap. Right. Okay. Uh, major oils versus watercolors and all that. But, there, but some of the similar chemistries were used throughout, but then some of them are only oils and some of them are only that. But most of it you'll find when the detail work was done, uh, the National Gallery, it's millions of dollars. Yeah. Uh, primarily because the value of paintings basically shot. Yeah. And uh, primarily oil paints, you can go by most of what was going on. And the pigment family stayed the same during different periods, and then they declined the value. Yeah, the scientific analysis has to be supported with some historical analysis. And you know, you've got to research it. And, and one way to research it is by looking at the art of the period. And then the paper gets the paper. Yeah. The you paper. want to study early printings in Nepal. You have your European paper, and then they just say native paper. Right. And this stuff is anything from Palur or India up to stuff that you use a box cutter on. <laughs> <laughs> and it's got chunks of wood in it. And, yeah. and then you come across strange things. This is just an aside. But this is what you get into so in the history. By 1872, the French outlawed lead paints for practical use on paintings. Lead and paints. 1872, they outlawed lead paints. Because they thought it was poison. They knew it was poisonous. And in 1918, titanium dioxide was introduced as a whitener. So, so one of the, go ahead. Uh, I sort of stating a question. I think most of the people in this room are probably not technophobes. But they wouldn't be here. Uh, but sometimes, for lots of folks, the equipment we've talked about, what it can do, is a little overwhelming. Uh, but what we are trying to do is answer questions that people have. Sometimes they've had them for years, that, you know, decades. And while <coughs> say some of the folks in this room might be able to come up with questions that they think they know how this equipment can answer, a lot of your friends probably don't but they still have questions. And so the key is to, to find the questions that we want to have answered about our hobby, and then determine, can the technology we've been talking about help to answer those? Now sometimes it may not be obvious, sometimes there are people in this room that could answer those questions. Uh, sometimes it will take a group of people talking about this to, to see if, yeah, I think we can come up with the answer by doing X, Y, and Z, because if, as you see, a lot of the projects that we've done thus far have tried to help us understand what this equipment and this technology can and cannot do. So I think the key thing is starting with the question rather than, say, starting with the technology. I think we've gotten to that point. So while you, you folks may be a lot more facile with it, it's a lot more comfortable, you all have friends who you know have questions about what they, their hobby and what they collect and what they study but they have no idea whether those questions can be answered. Mm -hmm. We'd like to hear what those questions are. I suspect that we can probably help determine whether they can or likely can be answered by our techniques. So I, I'd urge you, and when you start talking to your friends who may be less techno technophilic uh, than, than you folks are, let them know that there may be, we, there may be ways of answering those questions. 
and we'd love to hear from them, and we'd love to help them. By the way, Marcus, Marcus is one of the directors of IAP, as is his cohort, Jim, sitting next to him. But I think you struck on something that is, is the key reason that we're not handing out more research grants than we're handing out. People might be nervous of, of uh, appearing to be foolish or naive because they don't know what question to ask. Just ask the Philatelic question. Mm -hmm. There are people who can help you hone in on whether or not it's answerable with widget A or widget B. For example, yes, let's, let's, let's suppose you have two stamps. They look the same, they're the same printing. What do you what do you want to know? Do you want to know if the inks are the same? If that's all you want to know, you, you, you use one gadget. If you want to know what the components of the ink were, what minerals are actually in the ink, you'd use a completely different gadget. Completely different. And if you want to come to the Post Museum and you're just touring DC and you want to and you visit the Post Museum, you can bring one or two stamps and come into the lab and I can look at the stamps with you. You don't have to have a research project to use the equipment. And, and one other thing is we're not these projects are not just to, to, to find something esoteric about philately that may not mean anything to any anybody but you or a few other folks. Uh, those those things can be done and, and they should be done. But and, and as we see, they can be used to determine is this genuine or not? Um, associated with the Telic Foundation. And we're very interested because in certain cases it can help do what is very difficult right now. Is this stamp genuine? Is this cover genuine? Right. But they also have much more uh, other practical aspects to it. Jim struck them, and this is why I mentioned this. It can help tell you how you store your stamps, what to keep them away from, which may be very different than what people have been telling you up to now because they got the composition of the inks wrong. Mm -hmm. I th that, that's like wow to me. Yeah. Uh, it could take you down the right path instead of the wrong path. So there's a lot of practical aspects to this beyond the sort of more scientific aspects. The gentleman in the corner has a, has a yeah. Is there any application of this to the envelopes themselves, say, hand illustrations or patriotics or things like that. Do you know if anybody looked at any reason to look at that? No, I, I haven't had anybody look at it. I mean, I mean you, what, you I'm know, obviously you've got color and you've got analysis needs that you want yeah, to no, I But no, we don't, I don't know of any studies that anybody's even thought about you know, looking at these. I mean, I'm trying something really esoteric right now. I'm trying to read a watermark on a stamp that's on a cover. <laughs> I'm trying that right now, and uh, yeah, not too successful yet, but I'm getting a little closer. What about taper thickness of stamps on cover? Oh, well, I don't know how to do that. Because that's something I think that comes up that's really thick as mine as mine. I mean, you can use the micrometer to measure the thickness of the envelope and then measure the thickness of the stamp on the envelope and then subtract it. But, uh, you don't know how thick the glum is or right. if that takes yeah. up space or whatever. Right, exactly. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So that doesn't But if it's slick, it might not be on the stand anymore. <laughs> <laughs> if it's not there, it's That's not sticking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm sort of interested in some of the more common problems that some of us colorblind collectors have. And that's like telling the difference between the 90 cent bank notes or the five cent Jeffersons. Uh, how useful would this equipment be in setting up parameters so that you know that, well, okay, this one falls within the parameters, you know, and it's spot on, whereas, because I worry about fading and contaminated ink and well, we started bleeding over from one color to another shade. Yeah, I mean, Dave Harrigan and I did a project last oh, a couple years ago, our first project, and Jim Allen was, was another co-author of the project. And we did look at that issue. And the video spectra comparator, the 6000, you can do that by looking at the reflectance curves and the variety in the reflectance curves, the variance in the reflectance curve. That's technically measuring the color, electromagnetic spectrum. Reflection of the color. 
No machine will tell you that this is a carmine red. No machine will tell you that it's an emerald green. It'll give you either the elements of the ink. It'll give you a fingerprint of the ink where you can then analyze the fingerprint, or it'll give you a reflected scope. So then, within any given family, then you can for instance, you can also see coming out in the Chronicle uh, a study on the 1856 through 1865 centers, okay? That range of colors you get in there. I'm looking at the inks, but I don't have a broad range. You know, I mean, you have six or eight or 10, 15 examples. But if you have families of these colors and you have families of the pigments, and um, can you more effectively then associate that family with a color name? Probably can. Probably can, yeah. We're working on different aspects. I was looking mainly at the ink composition, but yes, color would be part of that. And, um, but you have to work on the family. So the problem is there aren't standards for any of these things. There are not any standards. And you have to develop basically standards within a family. Okay. And there's no concordance for color names. Right. Nope. Right. No. And they're very fanciful. Right. Yeah. Based on culture, I mean, you go back in history on all these inks when you try to do the historical work, you'll see four or five names converge on one color, and you'll see one color blow up into four or five names, or you'll see four colors blow up into one name, if you will. I mean, it's it's over a period of 400 years that this if, stuff happens. If you go to the IAP website, one of the uh, tabs on the IAP website are uh, reference papers, and they have reference papers, including Dave, Jim, and mine, for paper on color, and you can, you can read about that. For our paper, we had over 2,000 samples that you ran to make some determinations. So you can't take five stamps and put it on and say, this is a red carbine, and everything that looks like this is going to be a red carbine. You have to use a whole lot of samples to make it. That's why practically over the years, people develop, if you will, standards and, and have color standards before them as examples, by example, and then use those examples to further the concept of standardization, unfortunately. Yeah. We spent two solid weeks using the, the BSC 6000. But it samples. would be possible to nail it down with more precision. You could. With, you could. Uh, uh, yeah. you know, if you want to do the study and you have enough sample, absolutely. You can, you can come in and down. use the equipment in them. It's all non-destructive equipment. What's your sample, minimum sample size? And what's yours? You're the scientist. <laughs> <laughs> one stamp is a sample. One, yeah. one stamp is a sample. No, it's yeah. a question of what the population is to be. Statistical. <laughs> See, one of the problems is. 30? <laughs> well, you talk about these variations. Uh, how much variability is it? That's one of the things that's not known. If you look at the five cent stamps, tremendous variability. Oh, yeah. But some of them are faded a little bit. And then others are pure. And so you go. Um, you know, when you start looking at it with this comparative thing, you go, is that a real color or not? Or is it a faded example or not? And I, I would say out of this research, one aha I had, even though I'm a chemist by right now, was that, and this is why I'm going to give some, a little bit of unasked for advice about protecting stamps a little bit differently, perhaps or a little bit more than we have been in the three cent area, that probably these stamps may have changed a little bit more than so these variations in basically almost the same color, does that affect the value of uh, valuation of the same? It absolutely can. It can. So then how if you if it's kind of an unknown of what the standard is, then how do you come up with a value? Or what the value it's as good as your expertising agencies today. People with standards, with stamps and judgment. That's what the, the world is based on in the stamp. You know, that's what the stamp world is based on. An expert guess to it. Exactly. One of the good things that have come from the, the Institute of Analytics Wednesday is the advertising committees are now purchasing some of the scientific equipment. The Royal has had a, a BSC 6000, the Royal in London, and the Vincent Green Foundation that does most of the Canadian advertising has a BSC 6000. I know that the Philatelic Foundation and the APS have put in their budgets to purchase purchase one. So, you know, they're going to start using the scientific equipment to answer the hard questions. And we're proud of that. We're happy of that. That's happening. That's exciting.
Got another quick question. Did, over the years, didn't the Postmaster General issue out the rules and regulations as far as what type of ink should be used or what color this ink should be? I mean, was that done? Or is it just was stuff to the printer? Did, did he say, I want a red stamp and it's up to the printer to come up? Well, the stamp design committee at the uh, post office makes some determinations like that, but I, I can't answer that question. I don't know. FDR told me what color he wanted to stamp. So. But in the early days, I don't think seen any. Well, well they do as they do proofs and get the, you know, and right. trial colors and right. get, the, get the approved. The problem is, lots of times they lock in the trials and they'll tell people the what day colors. Day. And just as you said, and then over a period of time, in-house, people start changing the color on their own, <coughs> mixing it differently. I got a good, good buy on this pigment. That's when the UPU uh, was formed. There was an international agreement that one cent stamps would be green, two would be red, five would be blue. But well, what's blue? Yeah. There's a yeah. hundred shades of blue. If you look at the plate proofs, if you look at the plate proofs from the, from the bureau. They often tell you exactly what ink was specified to be right. used to print it. Right. But you may not know what the formulation of that ink is because that's proprietary for your right. What about the private contractor? Have you ever seen anything, any directives from the POD about ink formulation? No, both of them were secretive and they just said uh, what you submitted is fine. We like it. Well, it. This is a history, like I said, this 1851, you know what they call that stamp? 1851 three cent, and if some of you may be familiar with it. Red. We like the red color. Keep it red. <laughs> there you go. What kind of Of course, the most famous ones, the prettiest ones in my mind, are the orange browns. Red. <laughs> oh. I think we're our time is up. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming.